So another part of Nina I've had multiple questions about recently is framing. And I'm just gonna kick through this interface and go over some of the major concepts here. If I miss anything or you have any questions, definitely feel free to ask. It's gonna come up in other videos naturally as part of a progression moving through targeting and advanced sequences, etc. But I wanna make sure we at least lay some foundation for you here. So before we go into this, normally you need to figure out what you're gonna frame. So you typically wouldn't start here you're often gonna start at the Sky Atlas. So let's start with that. Let me go ahead and just search M31. So if I go into M31, I can say set for framing assistant. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna use this default image source that's configured here and it's gonna pull up an image from that repository. Now there's multiple options here. You can choose to use others. I find this one works. Depending on where you are in the world, you may find others are more responsive for you. You can also even use the Sky Atlas for offline framing. I'll talk briefly towards the end of this video about loading files and cache as well. So you can see I loaded this from the hips to fits sky survey and it doesn't quite fit the screen much like the imaging tab i can go ahead and fit this to the area and this entire image is a field of view of four degrees so that is a four degree image the more degrees you say to load the longer it's going to take for the file to come down it's going to be a bigger file to retrieve so four degrees is fine and why is four degrees fine for me right now because this box right here is my actual field of view based on these camera parameters. Now it's pulling these parameters in initially from my settings. So it pulled in my width and height and pixels, my pixel size and my focal length. Now this doesn't sync back and forth. You can actually manipulate this if you want to. So let's say I wanted to say, well, what does it look like on my C8? There we go. I've immediately changed the field of view and what my camera sensor would see at that focal length. Let's go ahead and put this back to my current true field of view for the scope that I'm actually using. Now, maybe I don't want this to be framed this way. Maybe for some strange reason, I want it framed up here. If I move this box around and I say, this is how I want it framed, what you need to do next is click recenter image. What that's going to do is tell the system to retrieve a new image from the image source centered on this new coordinate that I've defined by dragging my box around. You can see now this is recentered and this is critical because now that this is truly recentered, this is what I'm going to send to my sequence. This is what I'm going to send from a coordinate perspective when I do a slew and center. So let's just look at some of these options down here. I have the option to either just slew, slew and center, meaning slew to the location and use my plate solve to make sure I'm centered. Or if I have a rotator attached or even the manual rotator, I can tell it to slew center and adjust to rotation. Now the rotation only matters if I have a rotator attached and I tell it to use the rotator and potentially I've chosen to rotate my field of view so that I get a perfect match on my actual imaging. So notice I have the ability to add targets to a sequence or add targets to a target list. So let's just add this to a sequence. Now I'm not gonna add it to the simple sequencer. I'm gonna use the advanced sequencer. So I'm gonna mouse over here and notice my advanced sequences come up. Well, what one do I wanna add this to? Seeing that this is a galaxy, and I know it's an LRGB target, I'm gonna actually just send it to my generic mono LRGB with filter offsets, and I'm gonna click that. Now, when I click that, it immediately drives me to the advanced sequencer. You can see it dropped it into the advanced sequencer, into the sequence I requested, and that all of the parameters necessary to target this specific galaxy has been configured. I can now make modifications if necessary, or just go ahead and start my sequence. I'm gonna go ahead and close that out. So let's go back to framing. Well, what else can I do here? I can actually even choose to do mosaics. If I want to do a mosaic, maybe what I'll do is set some panels. You can see because I'm doing multiple panels, I quickly ran out of room here. So let me go increase 
the field of view and I'm going to do an eight degree field of view, which should be pretty large. And now you can see that this is a four panel mosaic, two horizontal and two vertical panels, panel one, two, three, and four, with a 20% overlap. And you can change that overlap percentage. I can even choose to rotate this as necessary or type in the fields. I can recenter it. And remember, when I choose to recenter, it's important that I recenter image to load the new coordinates for the panels. Now that I have this ready here, I have a couple options, right, from framing, right? I can slew and center this immediately, or I can add it to a sequence. Let's see what that looks like. Let's go ahead and add this to just a generic mono LRGB sequence. And remember, there's four panels, panel one, two, three, and four we have. So what actually happened here? It actually loaded four targets, panel one, panel two, panel three, and panel four. So if I chose to image this in one evening, I could then go modify these panels so their start and stop times worked effectively for me. And I can go ahead and start cycling through this immediately. Now, in this particular case, I'm gonna show you another way to do this from a mosaic perspective. And let's come back to framing. And instead of doing it that way and being too aggressive and thinking I could actually capture four LRGB targets in an evening, I'm gonna do it a different way. And what I can do is say, add the targets to a target list. And when I click this, it's gonna ask me, okay, but what sequence do you wanna do when you add this to a target list? And in this case, again, I'll stick with mono LRGB. And it adds them as targets. Well, what does that mean? Well, let me come back into my sequencer and notice up here in the advanced sequencer under targets, I now have my panels saved. So I have panel one, panel two, panel three, and panel four listed. And I can simply choose to drag and drop and load panels that I wanna shoot on any given evening. So now I have more flexibility that I've defined my framing and saved that target data to come back over a series of even weeks or months and obtain data when it's feasible for me to do so. If you ever need to delete these, you can simply drag and drop them onto the trash can. Okay, back to framing here. Let's get out of this mosaic and let's put our rotation back to normal and let's set this back to four degrees. Now, what if I took some images maybe a few weeks ago or a few days ago, and I wanna add data to it. What's the easiest way for me to do that, but make sure I'm capturing appropriate data to match the data I've already collected? Well, one option is to actually go in and load up a previous file from the other evening. Now I go to file and I can say load image. So where do I wanna load this data from? Well, it'll be wherever you save your data. So let me go back to some data just from last night. And I just got a couple images last night and I had a couple images last night and then it just got too windy and it was something that I couldn't continue. But this could have been a whole lot of data from an entire evening. But I'm gonna go select one of my images. I'll select it and open it. Now, because it's a fits image, it had reference data inside. And it's telling me that that particular image needs to be solved to frame it appropriately. And do I wanna use a blind solver or do I wanna use these reference coordinates? And I'm gonna use these reference coordinates that were embedded in the frames I took the other night. So it's gonna go ahead and solve that image and put it on screen. Now, let me go ahead and fit that to the area. Now, this is an image I took the other night and you can notice that I have the data here and this is the actual image. So this is how I actually want to be framed for this evening's images. A couple other things I didn't mention earlier because they didn't show up. Notice some of these objects are highlighted and I can zoom in and see that this has been identified as the bubble nebula and there's some other things down here as well, some NGC components. That data is actually up here and this is a display grid and I can choose to turn the grid on and off or I can choose to turn the NGC objects on and off. This is not part of my data, 
This is part of just an overlay display element to help you identify what's on screen when you're framing. There's also some other options up here to show you things like constellation names and constellation boundaries. So, okay, I've loaded my image up from the other night. I've plate solved it. It shows me what I have here, and now I want to match this this evening. And notice it even includes the rotation that I need to be at. Now, notice one thing before I move forward is that the name here is not accurate, right? It's the previous name. So I can actually change this by naming this element here appropriately from a saved file. This is gonna be the name that gets pushed into the target field, which then becomes part of the file name and potentially even image folder. So you may wanna update that when you go ahead and load from an image file. So now that I've got everything ready, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna actually add this to a sequence for this evening so I can continue my image acquisition. So what I can do here is I'm going to add this solved image to a sequence. I'm going to say sequencer, and I know that I did mono show with offsets the other night, but now I need a rotational element because my rotation is off from the other evening for whatever reason. So I'm going to make sure I rotate so that my framing matches and I'm not having to crop quite as much on the edges between evenings. By doing this, it's going to push it in to my advanced sequencer. So we can see I've got the bubble nebula here. I've got the coordinates that I solved from the previous imaging. I've got even a rotation here. And we're gonna go ahead and start this up. So notice the first thing it's gonna do is make sure that everything's in place. So it waited until time, and now it's gonna do a slew, center, and rotate. Notice the solve came up and the first thing it wants me to do is fix the rotation. So it wants me to move 31 degrees counterclockwise. So let me grab the imaging train and the rotator and try to get that back where it needs to be. Let's give that a shot. Click OK. It's now doing another plate solve to determine if my rotation is accurate. My tolerance is set quite low. I set my tolerance on this system to one degree. So it's telling me that I need to continue moving 1.8 degrees. And I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> That's about as close as you're gonna get. So let's go ahead and tell it to solve again. And hopefully I didn't overshoot the 1.8 degrees. So it looks like I overshot it a little bit. We'll bring it back. One degree might be a little tight. You may want to go a little bit higher than that, maybe two degrees. So we'll plate solve one last time, hopefully. We seem to be close enough on the degrees of rotation, and now we're just plate solving and trying to find the true centering that we're looking for. We're moving on to guiding here. So once the centering and rotation is done, I know that I've actually matched the framing from the previous evening and data acquisition will occur. And now I should be in a very good place after the end of this evening and the previous evening to merge the data sets together. While I let this run, I'm gonna come back to framing and show you the one last piece I haven't shown you yet. So every time you do a lookup and you do a framing from one of these online sources, Nina is gonna save that data. So if I go into the cache, I can see these are the ones that I've actually saved and pre-framed before, and I can load them up. So if I actually click on one of these, and I'll just click on the question mark galaxy in this case, once it's highlighted, I can say load image, and it's gonna pull up that previously cached image. So this can be handy for those cases where you're going to be taking your rig out to the field and you don't have internet access. Start your system while you do have internet access. Do your framing before you leave. If you ever wanna clear this cache, you can do that here. If you ever wanna find it on disk, it resides in the local app data folder. So just type percent local app data percent. If you're not a Windows person, there's a little shortcut for you. Go into Nina, and notice here, we actually have the framing assistant cache complete with all of those images that I've framed previously. 
As a side note, this is where all of your profiles happen to live as well. So percent app data percent in the file manager on Windows will get you to that location. Well, I'm gonna continue my evening. And if you have questions about framing or you want me to cover anything else in specifics, let me know. I'm glad to dive into it with you in another video. Hope this helped. Like, subscribe, and share. And as always, clear skies.